Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, good morning. Yeah, yeah, good morning. Yes, okay, thank you for replying. Okay, uh, first thing first, uh, Dr. Hyro already prepared tutorial two. Uh, let me swap the screen. Uh. Uh, let's see. Uh, I just uploaded the file. You can, uh, can you check, go to the file besides the post? There's a tutorial too. Because when I check Spectrum, I think he has not yet uploaded the file. So you can open the file. Can you, can you see that tutorial too? Yes. yes. Can you see the file? Yes. Okay. Uh, I already prepared the booking for tutorial two. So all the teams, you can go to uh, that WIS202 project team that folder. And inside there, I created the word file. Uh, this side I created a word file. Inside word file, then you can do all the bookings. Uh, I already assigned which team will answer which question. You can refer to that file and then later with our team members uh, who is going to answer each of the question right okay so i will assign which team will answer which uh, question they are all together 10 questions right okay okay now uh today let me start with uh, today's lecture first today's focus will be on the cost estimation and time estimation okay, okay let me swap the screen first Just a minute, let me swap the screen. Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, doctor. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, okay. So uh, today we start a quote first. So don't compare yourself with others. Just compare your today with your yesterday. So if there is an improvement, that's your achievement. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So let's start with today's lecture. So today you are going to estimate the project times and costs. So this is where we are now. Okay, number five here. So actually this diagram is the next like next week you're going to learn this is called network activity diagram, right? So now estimating projects. So today you learn how to uh, earlier when you define your post, your project objective statement, you are not sure how much cost you have to put for your project. So today after learning this, you are going to apply how to carry out the uh, project cost estimation. Then after that, you get the actual uh, better estimate of your project cost, and then you go back to change your post statement, the amount that you put, like, for example, earlier you put uh, 10 ringgit, Malaysia ringgit. So then after you have uh, learned this, and then you realize that it cannot be 10 ringgit. So you go back and then update value, okay, in your post statement. So first thing first, the always the definition. So what's the meaning of the term estimating? So estimating means is the process of forecasting. You are trying to predict or approximating the time and cost of completing project delivery roles. So that means you try to estimate how much time I need to finish each phase of the roles and then in the end, I deliver the final product to the customer. So this is the task of balancing the expectations of stakeholders and the need for control while the project is implemented. So as you go along, you can tell up to this point, I should spend how much money? Up to this, uh, am I uh, ahead of time, behind time, and so on? So you can control the time and the, the amount that you spend until certain point of time. So this is called why you need the estimation, project cost estimation. And of course, you can you can do that. Is uh, You will learn all the methods here, the macro method and the micro method. And then you can uh, see at each point that you can uh, keep control whether you are uh, over the budget or you are under the budget. So now, the types of estimates. So basically, today you're going to learn there are two types of estimates, the, the way that you're going to carry out. One is called top-down. Another term called for top-down is called macro. The macro estimates. So what are the methods under this uh, top-down estimates? They are called the analogy, the group consensus, or mathematical relationships. The second type is called bottom-up. And bottom-up means it's micro, very detailed estimates. So this, you are going to estimate the elements of the work breakdown structure in detail. So this is a better method. And then you're going to, I'm going to ask you to use 
this micro approach. So why estimating time and cost are important? So estimates are needed to support good decisions. You see, so you can tell, you see, based on the value, then you know whether you are going to do the project or not. So if this is worth doing or not, it helps you to make the decision to proceed or not to proceed. So with the amount that you know. So if let's say that amount is very huge, then say, oh, this project is not worth taking. So you just abandon it. So because it's like, it's going to be over cost. It costs a lot of money of the company. So it's not, uh, you should not uh, go and do this project. But if this project is something very good and then it's a reasonable, the, the total cost, then you will proceed because it helps in the long run for the company's profit. So estimates are needed to schedule the work. So as you go along, you will know at this certain phase of this particular work package, how much time I need to finish the work. Estimates are needed to determine how long the project should take and its costs. So it tells you the total time that you require estimate, how long is it for the whole project and how much is the total cost for that project. Estimates are needed to determine whether the project is worth doing. So you also tell you, see, just as I mentioned. So from there, you know, is it worth doing or not or not worth doing? Then you, you don't go and, uh, go and embark yourself on this project. It's just like about two years ago, you know, my, uh, my fridge in my house was struck by the thunderstorm. So I called the, the person who repaired the fridge to uh, give me. Then he came and then he, he checked on the thing. He said, oh, you know, it's the motor that struck by the thunderstorm and it's going to cost you about almost about 700, you know, to repair the fridge. So it just based on that amount, then I will know, is it worth uh, going to repair it or I should buy a new one? See, so, so of course, after checking the prices, you see, buying a new one is only thousand something. So it's not worth doing. So of based on this amount estimate that I know that it's not worth doing. No need to go and repair, better buy a new one. So the estimate is important for you to decide, make decision whether it's, you should go and take up the project or you should just abandon or you just KIB. So estimates are needed to develop cash flow needs. You see, at a certain point, you need to use the cash money to buy certain things. So by the time, so by the time you know, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, estimates are needed, you see, to know that whether this is a cash flow, at this certain point, you need the money in cash, how much you need to use it. So because this year uh, of the COVID-19, so I cannot propose a project uh, which is to organize a talk. So the team doing the organizing the talk, you have to collect some money from all the participants to organize the talk to buy the food. So you will know at a certain point, you need some cash in your hand to buy the food for the participant and then you want to buy certificate, printing the certificate or attendance and so on. And unfortunately, because of this COVID-19, we cannot have that project this year. Okay? So that's why maybe you cannot see, you know, where's the cash flow that coming in. Next is the estimates are needed to determine how well the project is progressing. So because of how you already mentioned that you are now, uh, you see, you, 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 are, you are, just a minute. Uh, I, I, something, I swapped something. <laughs> okay. Uh, so next is the, you, you, you need to, to know how well the project is progressing because at certain point you are monitoring the, how much money we spend at a certain point of time and how much the time we spend, whether you are uh, progressing well or you are behind time and so on or over cost. So this is at a certain point. So you're going to learn this uh, when you go along about uh, project progress monitoring. So you will come to this point again uh, later after the semester break. So estimates are needed to develop the time phase budget and establish the project baseline. See, from whatever you estimated, that is called the baseline. That means this is the founder uh, basic, that's the minimum, this is the amount that you require to carry out the project, right? And the time, you know, what is the duration for each phase, right? Okay, so next, uh, what are the factors influencing the quality of estimates? Okay, so these are basically, these are the uh, seven, factor, seven factors. Okay, there are basically seven factors here, okay? So we'll go through one by one, right? The first one, planning horizon. So estimate of current events are close to 100% accurate. So if you're planning current, you see currently, okay, how much is it? You, your estimation will be quite accurate. For distance events, so something that is quite far, okay, let's say uh, 10 years later, accuracy of estimates are reduced. You see, you're not very sure 10 years time, what is going to happen and how much the cost will be if this is the project going to carry out in 10 years later. Accuracy of time and cost estimates should improve as we move from the conceptual phase 
through the individual work packages. So when you come down, remember the highest level, the first phase is called conceptual phase. You try to form the idea first, then slowly you break down into all the small, small parts, uh, which you learn in your WBS or PBS, and then you go down to the lowest level, which is called the work packages. So when you come down to the lowest work packages, that's the, the smallest part, then you can do a good estimation for this. Okay, so now, so let's see. This is an example here. So this is your UM students doing the computer science. So this is the tuition fees in 2018-2019. Uh, but this is for international students. So you can see what is the total fees is uh, they put there in the I check from the website in US dollar, 15,784 US dollars. So when I try to convert this one to Malaysia ringgit, uh, I forgot to put RM here. It's about 65,582 and 20 cents. So just put 655H2 ringgit Malaysia. Ringgit Malaysia. This is for international students, right? So you can see this is the amount here. This, this is for uh, AI, Bachelor of Computer Science AI field, right? So this is the, you can see this is the amount for 2018 and 2019. Now, so now ask, I'm asking you, could you guess or you try to estimate what was the UM's Computer science total tuition fees in 2015-2016 for international students. What do you think? What was the amount? Anyone can guess? Anyone can guess? What's the amount? Yes, sir. Ah, um, okay. So roughly how much? 12K. 12K uh, Malaysia ringgit? Uh? No, no. 12K USD. USD, 12K. So convert to Malaysia ringgit, how much is that? 50K, somewhere around that. The, uh, 30K, uh, okay. Uh, 50, okay 50, 50. So I, I checked from the website, the, the estimate for, uh, not estimate, this, this is the, the actually they, they also put their estimate because the UM, will, they will, they may change the, the total cost. That's why they put the, the phrase there. So you can see, this is 2015, 2016. Bachelor of Computer Science, okay, uh, specialized in AI. So the total fees was, uh, so your, 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 you, you, you did a quite good estimation, it's quite close. It was 28,000 ringgit Malaysia, 520, uh, 520 for international students, AI field, because you can see a uh, different field, there's a variation here. Uh, slightly, uh, some, the highest is uh, 28, uh, AI is 28520. Uh, the highest is 28590. Uh, that is for the which one? That one is for uh, management information systems and and also for uh, 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 bachelor information technology and also the networking. Okay, so you can see a bit variation, but then you 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 give a quite a good uh, estimates. Uh, say about 30 30 RM 30 K right. Uh, so this one is about close to 28,520. So you can see here, the question is, uh, now I'm asking you, so you try to estimate. So what do you think? What would be the UM computer science total tuition fees in 2020 for international students? What do you think? So now it's, 20, now, now it's 2022, uh, 2020. Now in 2022, in two years time, what do you think will be the fees look like? The fee structure for international students. So the, the fee for this 2018, 2019 is 65,582. That's what 2018, 2019. And then the year for 2015, 2016 is about 28,520. So what do you think in from now, uh, 2020 from now, two years time, what do you think will be the fee structure, right? How much will be the composite total fees cost? Can you estimate? 100K. 100, 100K? Yeah? 120. <laughs> Okay. 100, 190. 20. Oh, 90K. Okay. okay, so so roughly you feel that uh it's, it's just two years from now, then you can estimate, uh, feel that it's quite confident in your estimate, right? So so definitely if you if you uh something that is very far away, uh, let's say for example, now this is the the, the price of Photon Saga in a uh, new launch for 2019. So the price range is uh, within 32,800 and, oh, sorry, I typed uh, uh, <laughs> 39,800 here, okay? <laughs> yeah, so this one is the current one, roughly, and this is based on the different models. So the question is, if you ask to estimate 
the cost or the price to buy this Proton Saga? What do you think will be the price of a new Proton Saga? Let's say there's a, a new model that they produce in 2029 and you're going to buy in 2030. Do you think you can give a good estimate? No, I think no. Yeah, because you find it very difficult, right? So because it's something very near, so that's the point. If you estimate something just near to you, just within one year, two years, so or within less than five years, you can do a good estimation. But if you ask to estimate something that is a 10 years, 20 years, you know, future, very long, okay, distance event, very long, long time later, then it's very difficult for you to give a good estimate because a lot of things can happen during this uh, 10 years time or 20 years time, okay? So that's why the accuracy is depending on uh, how far you have to, uh, the distance of the event, how how long is going to, for you to estimate the cost, okay, understand? Okay, next. So the next factor will be about the project duration. So the time to implement new technology has a habit of expanding in an increasing non-linear fashion. So that means if you apply new technology incorporate in your uh, project, to implement it then because you have to learn so in that case you it is not a linear form not in this kind of straight line form it will be something like curving or whatever you know curvy looks like so that that, that takes that uh, uh uh that make you that then very difficult to estimate what will be the uh, cost if it is you are applying new technology in your uh project that you're going to carry out so that's one factor so another issue is also poorly written scope specifications for new technology result in errors in estimating the times and costs. So because it's new to you, then you're also not sure and how to write the project scope clearly. So maybe something missing, say, oh, I, I don't, I'm not sure whether new technology can, uh, you know, that can cater for this need, can do certain features, certain functions or not. See, can provide you with certain things that you require. So become that you are ab not able to write a good clear scope how many functionality you should provide, you know, things like that. So later they thought, oh, there's some more missing, then add some more. So because of dear poorly written scope specification, that is going to cost you a lot of errors in your estimation of the time and the project cost that you need to implement the project. So another one just already mentioned, the long duration project, if the project itself takes a long time, so uh, project and compare with the 10 years project, see? So if the kind is a long duration project, also increase the uncertainty in estimates. Also, it will cost you not very sure in the value that you're going to estimate. Okay, so that is the second factor, project duration. So the third one will be about the people. Okay, accuracy of estimates depends on the skills of the people making the estimates. So that means the person who is doing the estimation, the estimator. So if the person is very good in doing estimation, then the person's the value that the, the estimator est estimated will be quite accurate. But if you get someone who is very new in doing estimation, then the person will give you a not so accurate type of estimate to you about project cost and how much time you need to carry out the project. Then it will uh, cause in the end a lot of problems that you're going to face, you know, over cost and then over budget and then quality not achieved. So a close match of people skills to the task will influence productivity and learning time. So similarly, the person who is going to carry out, you know, the work package all the tasks inside the project itself is also going to affect, see, because how much time you have to allocate for the person to complete the task. If the person is so familiar, if let's say you have uh, programming and the programmer is very experienced, so the programmer who is very experienced can just take, okay, one day I finish programming one of the module, but if you assign the this uh, programming course, uh, not the course, programming task to someone who is very new, a fresh graduate, not sure of some things you know like certain programming language you need to learn so the person will need some time to have some learning time first before the person can complete the task so that person who is a very uh, skillful and very experienced programmer just need one day but if you assign the task to another person who is new to this new programming language is still learning then the person probably will take 10 days so in that case the estimate for the one who is inexperienced you have to assign longer time for that person. So that again will affect your estimate. So adding new people to project increases time spent communicating. So if halfway through your project, you started the project and then another new member coming in and then join your project team. So the newcomer will not know what is happening. So you already started halfway through. So I think it's just like uh, two days ago, another student sent an email to me say, she just joined this course. And then our, our project already started, right? We already have uh, three weeks gone 
and this is our fourth week now. So I assign her to a team. So that team will have a bit of will be a bit slow down because the team leader has to go and start explaining to this team mem this team mem the new team member who just joined only and after three weeks later, then really miss quite a lot of things that she doesn't know what is happening now. What is that project about? So you have to start explaining what are the things uh, going on and then what kind of tasks going to assign to her, you see? And then you have to reallocate the tasks that are reallocated, assigned to other people and then share with this new member here. So that's why it will take time and increase our time spent communicating first before you can start working on the project, right? So that affects the your estimation, right? So people have only five to six productive hours available for each working day. Others are taken with indirect work such as meetings, paperwork, and answering emails. You see, it's like uh, when I'm answering email, it's taking me a long time. Then you're answering some phone calls, and then you have to do, we have to do administrative work, paperwork, and then we have to attend meetings, online meetings as well. So all these are indirect, indirect work, which may be related, maybe not related to the project itself, but it's taking your time. So the actual, the time that is spent on the project itself is only about five to six every day of your working hour. So again, that will impact on your uh, project time estimation, the actual time that you're going to spend on the actual work. So next, the next factor is our project structure and the organization. So challenges to organizing the projects. So the uniqueness and short duration of projects relative to ongoing longer term organizational activities. So it is related to what kind of organization structure that the company is having. So today I'm going to introduce to you there are three types of this uh, project uh, structure, project management structures, the functional organization, dedicated project team, and the project operating in a matrix environment. So this multidisciplinary and cross-functional nature of projects creates authority and responsibility dilemmas. So because you need people from the different uh, different units or different departments, so you've got some problems that are going to create uh, from this cross-functional nature because you get people from the different different departments to join and uh, work out the thing and then finish the project. So there are some kind of argument or conflict that's going to happen. So choosing an appropriate project management structure, so you have to know. So which is the best structure to carry out the project so that it won't affect the project delay and so on. So the best system balances the needs of the project with the needs of the organization. You look at your project, what kind of project you're working on. So what kind of this project management structure you should adopt, you should use to carry out this project. So today I introduce you to these three types here, the functional organization, dedicated project team, and the matrix form. Okay, so we'll go through this one by one. So this is the project management structures. So the first one, organizing the projects in from the perspective of the functional organization. So what is functional organization? So here means the different segments of the project are delegated to respective functional units. So within a project, you got different uh, people come from different departments or units. For example, you need people from the marketing, people from the sales, people from the R&D, people from the human resource, and, and so on. So the different department, you need people from different units to come and carry out the project for you. So each of that unit themselves is called a functional. Okay, they are functional part. So let's say a marketing, that is the functional part of the marketing unit, but they contribute some of the staff to carry out the project. So coordination is maintained through normal management channels. So here you have to coordinate each level. From the different de department, you have to get people how you monitor them. So use when the interest of one functional area dominates the project or one functional area has a dominant interest in the project's success. So out of this, there are many departments, many units involved. So maybe one of them is the main one. So let's say this project is more focusing on R&D. So the unit from R&D people, the manager from this unit, they have the dominant, they have more authority in this case. So now you look at this example here, this diagram here. So this is a look of the functional organizations. So this is the company here, the Delta Manufacturing Incorporated. The highest level is the president, then followed by supporting by the human resources department, finance and administration. And the next, the breakdown, the next level, you have the marketing, you have the engineering, you have manufacturing and procurement. So this is the, here, this is the functional organization. Means each of these functions, this unit here or this department here, they contribute to the project. To carry out the project so they got people from procurement or manufacturing engineering and marketing so let's say one of the unit dominant this project is from the engineering okay so this is the the, the people from there they have the more authority than the others but 
they all perform according to their function that they perform the marketing unit they do their job that contribute to the project about or oh, how you should design this so that you know it's easy for me to market you know engineering you know uh, then you break down to all the different departments here so this is called the functional organization according to the function performed by each unit or performed by each department so you need the coordination here see this level this level will be the project coordination level so these are the functional organization projects, the advantages and disadvantages because they are from the same uh, functional unit. So no structural change. Then you people from that unit, you just within that unit there. Okay, you are not taking other people from other uh, departments. So this is very flexible. So you can take anyone within your department to go and join the project to work on the project. At the same time, you perform your other same task, the function same uh, functional task within the same department. So in that expertise, anyone who is more experienced can. Uh, be selected from that department and carry out the project so easy post project transition because you stay in the same department you're not transferred out to another department so after you finish project you're assigned another project because you're, you're all the while you're in your same department so these advantages you lack of focus so when you are doing your own job you sign you assign another task then you're not so focused so poor integration because you've got people involved from different units so one of the say okay some of them will say, okay, uh, I do my job first. Your one is not so important. This is, I'm assigned the project. But, you know, let me do my job first. I finish my one, that only I do your one. So it's not really that good in the sense that, you know, I'm not going to really focus on your job. Say, and then uh, you wait for me first. Okay, I, let me finish my important job. That only I do your job. Okay. So, and then you have to talk to, because it's not within the same department, you have to pass to, go to the different, go to another, maybe go up to manager, go down to another level to get to the, uh, other people to help you to carry out the following tasks and so on. So it will be very slow because of involve many departments and then lack of ownership that unless the one with the authority say, oh, uh, who is the owner, the main owner of this project, the person has a higher authority to say something that I'm not the owner that I'm, I don't care. See, I put your project at the side first, I do my uh, my main job first. Okay. So the lack of ownership, it is of this uh, functional type. Okay, the second one is called the dedicated teams. So teams operate as separate units under the leadership of a full-time project manager. So in this case, you're going to choose one person. The main person is called project manager. And this project manager is going to get one team. These team members come from all the people from the different functional units, but they dedicated to that project only, not doing other job, only that project. So this speed gain from concentrated focus and localize the project decision. So become you are focusing, do the project only, you are not doing your other job now. So in the projectiles organization, where projects are the dominant form of business, functional departments are responsible for providing support for its team. That means every function part, I give you the staff, and then the staff will be working on the project alone. You see, so this is how it looks like, the dedicated team. So this is the company here. You have the marketing, engineering, manufacturing, procurement. Then you form this a special team. This is called the dedicated team. And this one is led by this project manager, a person called project manager. So what are the team members? Who are the people here? This team member will come from marketing, engineering, manufacturing, procurement, you know, let's say one or two from each of these departments, and then form this special team called the project team. And they are called dedicated team means they only work on the project. They are no more serving their unit. They are no more serving their own department. They just come out from the team selected by whatever the manager there and then okay you go to the this project special project and you only do that project now you are not doing other work only this project so that's why it's called dedicated team and there's one project manager going to lead this team right so this is a structure and because of this structure so you can see the advantages so it's very simple because everyone is just chosen you're just focusing one project so it is very fast you're not doing other job only that project so it's cohesive now you all sit together and then do the job together and then you're moving towards the achieving the goal of the that you set for that project and then you have the cross-functional integration you see everybody i pick from the different department then help out each other each part that you should contribute to the success of the project so these advantages is expensive because the person is originally is attached with the department now you pick up the person and then go to do another project so that department will not have the staff maybe have to get another staff to replace the job that the person has to do in that department because the person already assigned to a specific uh, project so this is internal, you may have internal strife, so they may have some fighting among. If you come here and then say you're from a different department or a different idea, they may have different argument because you are asked to do this project and some will be quite senior, you know. So this thing can happen. Internal strife here is like some argument, some conflict that going on, okay, within this team.
the limited technological expertise because the person you selected to contribute to this project maybe it's not someone is really that is uh, expertise in that area that is chosen to carry out the project so difficult post project transition because this person already pick up from the department and then just go to do carry out the project so if the project takes about three years four years then after you finish project then where are you uh, going to go to where, where do you go to because you really ask to do that specific project you're no more attached to your original department so this is difficult difficult when you where to send you to after you finish the project are you going to assign new project or are you going to return back return you back to your original department okay so these are the disadvantages so next is the type called metric structure so metric structure means this is designed to optimally utilize resources by having individuals work on multiple projects as well as being capable of performing normal functional duties that means you are attached with your department but at the same time i'm asked you to do other things uh, and other projects so you do it in parallel so together you see so this environment may reduce costs by more sharing efficiently sharing personnel across the projects but may take longer to complete since attention is divided and coordination demands are higher see because you are doing serving your department you are also asked to do the project at the same time so you cannot concentrate so you are you're supposed to do your own work first or you're supposed to do the project work assigned to you so this approach attempts to achieve greater integration by creating and legitimizing the authority of a project manager so in this case you see you are serving a department so you've got your own department manager and you are also serving the project so there's a project manager so in this kind of structure, the project manager has a higher authorities. Okay, they try to have the project manager, uh, project manager having the highest decision making authority. Okay, so this is how it looks like. Uh, one of the uh, example here. So the matrix form. So within this company, you can see. Okay, so this company here, you can have uh, there's a project A. Okay, project A, and you have one assigned project manager to handle project A. There's another project called project B. There's another project manager to handle project B. There's a project C called a project manager uh, C to handle this project C. And all these project managers, they are under one uh, director of projects. One of the director of this project handle look after all these three projects. So in each of these projects, there's someone assisting, helping this project team A here. So you have one uh, administrative project administrative administration. There's one assistant that is helping. So the, this is one, one is half. Half means part-time, part-time staff. So the project A got one assistant to helping, a project B one a full-time assistant helping the project B, and then a part-timer helping assisting this project C doing administrative work. So this project E here, so come from where? They are start coming from, okay, this is, you can see this is two, one, two, one, two, half, one. So the two, one, two, one here, these are all people come from, two, one, two, one total will be six. Six star will come from engineering contribute to project A. So these six staff, they are working for their department engineering. They attach with their own uh, department. They do their own job under that department, but they also serve this project A. They also help to carry out the task that is this project A needed and also under the leadership of project A manager. And next you can see under manufacturing is two half one. So that means it's three and a half. That means three uh, full-time staff and one part-time staff from the manufacturing a department will contribute to doing this carry out the project a under the leadership of project a manager so you see in this case it's called matrix i'm serving my own department at the same time i'm serving doing the job for project a so same thing goes for the project b and the project c so this is how you read the di diagram here that means you are doing two things okay so it's just like i'm the i'm a lecturer from the software engineering department but besides I'm doing software engineering, that's my teaching and my research, my main task under this department. I'm also assigned other tasks. Uh, that was uh, about a few years back. I was asked to be to sit in a committee. So you have wants to convert the system. You know, they want to change to ERP system. They, they want to convert this system, no more using the old system. They want to convert to another new system and they want to uh, get, uh, you know, they want to give out this tender and after that, a lot of vendors, they submitted their proposal and then what they can do for UM's uh, finance, how they do the financing, all these things, and then all, all the budgeting, you know, whatever the system to support uh, all the, the, the uh, whatever the finance side of the UM, okay, the management to help the finance side. So they need to get a vendor. So they invited me to join seat in the committee. So you see, I'm serving, I'm lecturer doing this job, but at the same time, I'm called because uh, there's a, 
you know, the call for tender and, and we have to evaluate all the proposals. So from all the different vendors, it takes a long time, a few months. Uh, so I was asked on and off to go to attend the meetings. Please. So in this case, I'm serving, I'm doing my main job. So when they call me, if I have a class, then what do I do? You see, I have to say that, oh, I have a lecture. I cannot attend the meetings that you set, you know, the date is the conflict with my teaching, my staff, all the, 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 the tasks that assigned to me. So I have to finish my main functional task first, then only I go to the project you assign me, which is uh, in the selection of the vendor that is suitable uh, to get this uh, handle this, this job here. So that's why uh, a lot of things, you see, they will see these are the conflicts going on. And because, you see, I'll be under the, my head of department will be my boss, this from the functional unit. But there is also a project manager from there that can be also is my leader under that project. So in this case here, you can see there's a division of project manager and the functional manager responsibility in this matrix form. So here the project manager, in this case, what will the project manager side make? What kind of decision? And what about the functional manager side will do what? So and then in between, there are some part where they have to negotiate the issues uh, between the two, the project manager and the functional manager. So project manager will decide what has to be done and functional manager will decide how will it be done. And then the one that both of them will negotiate will be who will do the task. Second one, project manager will decide when should the task be done. So this functional manager have no say, only the project manager will say, okay. And then next, the negotiation uh, usually between this will be where will the task be done. So next, how much money is available to do the task? So the project manager will have the say. And then functional manager will, how will the project involvement impact the normal functional activities? See, the functional manager is very concerned about their, his or her own functional activities. So he, this person will decide on this. And project manager will uh, ask about how well has the total project been done? And functional manager will be, how well has the functional input been integrated? So in between, there's something that both of them can negotiate will be, is the task satisfactorily completed? So you see, there will be, you see, there are two, uh, leaders here, the project manager and the functional manager. So they will have some kind of negotiation and if they don't cannot negotiate, that will end up with some kind of conflict. Okay, so these are the, uh, they are also uh, can be classified the matrix form into three different forms. Huh? So one is called weak form, second one is called balance form and the third is called the strong form. So weak form means the authority of the functional manager predominates and the project manager has indirect authority. So if called weak form of matrix form, that means the functional manager has higher authority than the project manager. Most of the decision made will be by the functional manager. So if it is balanced form, means 50-50. The project manager sets the overall plan and the functional manager determines how work to be done. So each one half-half. You do half, you make half the decision, I make another half of the decision. So strong form will be the project manager has broader control and functional departments act as sub subcontractors to the project. Means in this case, strong form means project manager will dominate. Project manager will make most of the decision making. Functional manager side, you just give me the support. I need what you just support. I need who is the person you just give me the stuff. Okay. So this is called weak form, balance form, and strong form of matrix structure. Okay, so that's why these are the advantages and disadvantages of the uh, organization which is in the matrix form. So advantage will be efficient because you make use of the person uh, doing the functional and also doing the project. You see, you, you cut your cost. Okay, so you have strong project focus. So when I ask you, okay, you do this, you just, you know, if you're dominant by the project, then you say you focus on this project. Easier post-project transition because the person all the while is stay in the same department, is not transferred out. So this is flexible. Okay, so you just can choose anyone who is suitable, anyone who can do the task. So these advantages will be this functional conflict. So you have two uh, functional things that to perform. So it could be conflicting. You have to do which one first? In fighting. So again, it could be some arguments between the project manager and functional manager over certain issues. And then for the staff that working in the project, because I'm working for my functional part, my, my project leader, uh, my project department, here my uh, department are under this particular department, but also go and do another work. So it's quite stressful to the staff. So it could slow down because if uh, my work will be slowed down because like uh, I mentioned just now, okay, I have to teach. I cannot go attend your meeting. Uh, so maybe they want to wait for my for me to attend the meeting or postpone the meeting so it can slow down the the you know the pro the process. Okay, so it can be slow if uh, that is some kind of uh, you know the conflicting in the times time constraint here. So next is the organization structure. So some organizations believe that 
detailed estimating takes too much time and is not worth the effort or that it is impossible to predict the future. Some say that, you know, you do detail, it's quite impossible. You want all the detail. No, no, no. You cannot find all the detail and give a very good estimate. So you just do a rough one enough. Other organizations subscribe to the belief that accurate estimates are the bedrock of effective project management. Some organizations, the, the boss will say, no, no, no. We need a very accurate, accurate, so accurate of uh, estimation, the cost and the time. Otherwise, it's going to affect the project progress. Then the project may fail. See, some, some will say, no, 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 I need accuracy. Some will say, no, 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 the rough one will do. Okay? Organization culture shapes every dimension of project management. So estimating is not immune to this influence. See? So the culture, your boss, your boss is one to believe that you need to do detail or your boss believes that this is no need to be detailed, just the rough one will do. So it will affect, see, in the end, what kind of estimation you are, you are going to get. But uh, actually, it's, uh, in my opinion, sometimes it's no need to be too detailed because things happen. You see, you see, there are a lot of things. It's just like now, we never get to know that there's a COVID-19. So whatever you plan, it's going to be have to be revised. So whatever estimation you make, you have to change now because there are a lot of things surrounding us, there are a lot of factors that are happening, events that happen around us that is unpredictable. So that's called the risk. So if you make a lot of accurate estimation, but in the end something that happened, you have to go and re-estimate. So you wasted a lot of time doing a very detailed estimation. So something that is good enough, then just good enough. No need to do so detailed. In my in my personal opinion, it's not, not too rough, also not too uh, not too macro, you see, not too brief, but it's uh, reasonable, okay, and good enough to guide you about the estimate that's good enough. Okay, so next, the next factor is called the padding estimates. So in work situations where you are asked for time and cost estimates, most of us are inclined to add a little padding to increase the probability and reduce the risk of being late. So it's just like asking you how much time you need to finish that task. So uh, basically, maybe it's about, let's say you need about three days, but you can add a little bit more time. Then you say, oh, no, it's five days. See, you add, that's called padding, add some more. Three days, you add two more days. So it's called padding, extra two more days. So if everyone at all levels of the project adds a little padding to reduce risk, because you're afraid something happened. That is, if they tell you three days, something happened, and then uh, something screw up, and then, oh, I cannot finish. So that's why I add a little bit, I said two more days. And uh, then when I, within two days, maybe something happened, also I still can deliver within five days. You see, that means I'm very good. I still meet the deadline. So if everyone go and add a bit, a bit, instead of afraid that this is going to happen to the task, so everyone is add something, something to your time duration or the cost, the project duration and the cost are seriously overstated, you see? So if you add up all the work packages, so this person, okay, person A in charge of work package WP1. So the person supposed to three days, so add two more days, become five days. The WP2 and another person doing the W2 owner of WP2 say, oh, supposed to be eight days. So I say it's 12 days, you see? Everyone add a bit, a bit, a bit. So the project duration becomes a lot, you see, it becomes like uh, getting the, instead of the uh, actual number of, let's say, is you need about 30 days, but it ended up become 40 days, you see. So it got extended a lot, so it becomes like overly stated. So this phenomenon causes more, the sum of these managers, they realize, you know, people will do padding. So these managers, they are very smart. So they will call for a 10 to 15% cut in time or the cost for the project. So they know that whatever value that give to them, the time or the uh, total cost, then the manager know this is, the sh I'm sure there will be some padding, the adding going on. So I'm going to cut whatever amount you give to me or the time frame you give to me. I cut all this, the total amount, 10 to 15%, cut it first. Okay, you understand? So the manager, they know. People will do padding. Okay. So next is uh, about other or non-project factors. So this include equipment downtime, can alter the time estimate because you never expect. So the certain equipment you need to use suddenly is break down, cannot be used. So you have to wait, send for repair, and then after the equipment is back, then only you can use it again. So other issues like national holidays, there suddenly there's some kind of holidays that uh, that the government declare. Like for example, you know last time when they say you know when uh you know last time when say Lee Chong Wei if can get you know the gold medal in the Olympic Games then the tomorrow will be the national holiday see so unexpected certain day tomorrow is declared as holiday so same thing like COVID-19 so now you cannot work cannot go to office to work so suddenly government announced this announced that ah, so you see this other thing will affect your cost estimation and your time estimation then you cannot proceed if you cannot go to work then the the, the job there will be stopped there and you cannot proceed especially like 
uh, you know, the construction work. I, I noticed some of them, they're doing, you know, renovation. I see all the renovation all stop. So now if they can resume after governments uh, say, okay, after they lifted the things, okay, now we can continue and start work again. So all the things get delayed. So it was supposed to plan to finish within this month, then you cannot finish. Okay. So vacation, some of the staff go for holidays, then suddenly it will be affect your project progress. And legal limits, for example, somebody is, you know, uh, some legal issues. For example, if somebody like, like witness and uh, uh, some kind of accident that happened or some kind of murder, and this person is a witness. So when the, the let's say, whoever is caught involved in this, uh, you know, this incident and it will happen to be witness, and then the court, there's a court going on, the trial going on, then the, the court will uh, issue a summon to ask this witness to go to court. So if you are the witness, then you cannot go to work. Instead of go to work, you go to the court. So that will affect your project progress. So this can influence the project estimates. So next is where the project priority can influence resources, assignment, and impact the time and cost. You see, so within the project, the company itself, there are many projects going on. So the company will prioritize the project. So the one who has the highest priority will be given the resources first. So you say, oh, this is very important. So I give you the resources because it's limited resources. I need the same resources. So this project more important, giving me more profit. This one do first. That one not so important, you do later. So the one do later one will be affected, you know, the time, the time factor there. So you have to wait. See, you cannot use the equipment or certain resources. You cannot proceed. So that affected your time progress in your project. So estimates of time and cost together allow the manager to develop a time place budget which is imperative for the project control. So from this, estimating the time and the cost, then you can you, you will know after certain day or certain time, uh, how much you know resources I need to allocate, how much money I need to finish this particular type of task within this uh, time frame here. So you require to do all these estimates, okay, in terms of time and the cost, okay. So these are the factors that will affect all the accuracy of the estimation. Next is the estimating guidelines for times, cost, and resources. So when you do this estimation, so what, what should you uh, focus? So what should you take note? So have people familiar with the task, make the estimate. So just now we mentioned, if the estimator is someone inexperienced, the person will make estimate which is not so accurate. So you better get someone who is familiar with the task to do the estimation for you. Then the value that the person estimated will be more accurate. Later, you won't get into trouble, you know, like, oh, not enough money allocated and so on. So you use several people to make estimates. So if that estimator, you, you don't quite trust the estimator, say, I'm not very sure the estimator can give me a good estimate or not. Then you, instead of use one person to do estimation, you get two or three people. So get a few people to do estimation, then maybe you will take the average value for all these people's estimation. So base estimates on normal conditions, efficient methods, and a normal level of resources. So when you do estimation, you base on the normal condition. That means you don't assume something going to happen. You don't quite assume that, oh, I think one this staff uh, may go on vacation. Uh, I think I uh, have to uh, extend a bit longer time for this task or no need. So you just do everything, assume that everyone will come to work a normal day. Don't quite assume, you know, that there was one time suddenly there was a flood, you know, uh, many years ago. I think anyone, if you stay in uh, this Shah Alam, I think the, the Shah Alam area was uh, flooded, you know, and then all the staff, they cannot come out. So one of the, we have some staff also staying in Shah Alam. And then the, their house was, uh, you know, uh, the, the water, you know, went into one level, you know, the ground floor. And then they all have to go up and stay in upstairs and cannot get out from the house. So the person cannot come to work. So you don't have to assume that uh, there will be a flood, a flash flood or something like that, that cause uh, the staff cannot come to work or something happened. No, everything you just you assume normal. Because later you are going to assign a value called contingency fund to cover those uh, unexpected things that happen. So you use consistent time units in estimating task time. So when you estimate, you also use standard unit. So if your estimation, everything unit measurement is days, then all in days. If everything all in months, all in months, not some days, some months, some seconds, some minutes, no. So you standardize the unit of measurement. So what is the unit you use? Is month, is month. If they say it's days, then it's days. Okay. You treat each task as independent, do not aggregate. So that means each task, each WP is, I don't depend on you. So in real life, maybe you is dependent. One task dependent on another task. It's called dependent task dependency. But when you do estimation, you treat them as separate. They are not dependent on each other. I, I don't depend on you. You don't depend on me. You just do the estimation on your own. Okay. But in real life, definitely it's not. But when you do estimation, you just treat it that way. They are all independent tasks. Okay. Don't go and sum up them. 
So do not make allowances for contingency. You see, just how I mentioned. So you just consider it's normal condition. Don't go and think of anything. Suddenly some emergency happen that I have to cater all these emergency things. No need. So it just treat it as normal uh, estimation. Everything goes smoothly, assume like that. So adding a risk assessment helps avoid surprises to stakeholders. Later, there'll be a chapter after semester break. There's a chapter about risk management. So in this risk management, you're going to assess what are the possible risks that are going to happen to your project. And then from there, you will allocate some contingency funds to cover these unexpected risks that are going to cause some project delay, uh, over cost, uh, you know, the time that delay that will cause all these things to happen to you. Uh, then you allocate some uh, funds to cover these emergency things. So these are called the contingency funds. Okay, So we will cover that in the risk management chapter. So next, you are come to how to do the cost estimation. So they are basically just now introduced to you. There are two uh, methods. One is called the macro method. The other one is called the micro. So what are the differences? The macro versus the micro estimating. So conditions for preferring top down or bottom up time and cost estimate. When when you use macro, when you use micro, when you use top down, when you use uh, bottom up. So these are the conditions here for macro and the micro estimates. When you, the condition is strategic decision making so you need to make strategic decision making strategic decision making means it's long term okay so it's far far away so just now i mentioned to you the factor if you want to estimate something far far away then it's not so accurate so you will apply the macro estimates approach so if it is cost and time important so if the customer say no the cost amount you give me make sure it's quite accurate uh, then you have to do micro estimate micro means very detailed estimation so if you have high uncertainty, not very sure what is project the scope, not very clear, things like that. Okay, then you use macro. If it is internal small project, very small project only, so it's very easy for you to do estimation, then again you use macro estimates. So if this is a project that is a fixed price contract, you know, that is amount, I give you this is 200,000 project, that is it, you cannot have exceeding this amount. Uh, then you have to be very careful and then do a very detailed estimation for the project. You use micro approach. Customer wants detail. Customer will say, no, no, I want detail. Don't give me the rough one. Uh, then you have to do the micro estimates. Next one will be unstable scope. You're not very sure. It's going to expand. Whatever the spec, they're going to add from time to time. So since you're not sure, then you use macro approach. So the rough estimation instead of detail. Estimation. So these are some guidelines to guide you when to use apply the macro, when to use the micro. So next, we are going to learn, okay, so uh, later you are going to come to this, uh, the different approaches. So before that, estimating projects, the preferred approach. So basically, if you do since got macro and micro, actually how you should go about doing this uh, cost estimation or time estimation. So first, what you do will be, you make a rough top-down estimate. That means you do a macro first, a rough one first, overall of your project first. Next, you see, you will learn, develop the WBS, OBS. You, you have your work breakdown structure or PBS and then with your organization structure. So after that, you make bottom-up estimate. Now, after you make a macro approach, you use one of the method there, and then now you do the micro approach bottom-up. So after that, you develop the schedules and the budget, you allocate, you see, how much time for each task, and then what's the amount for each one. Then next, you will be re reconciled differences between the top-down and bottom-up estimate, because when you use macro, micro, the amount will not be the same. Then you look at the two different values, and you go and balance out what is the difference between the two so that they come to a some kind of center point okay <coughs> okay now we come to the methods for estimating project times and costs using the macro approach also known as top down approaches so under these macro approaches we are going to learn consensus methods ratio methods a portion method function point methods for software and uh, system projects and also about learning curves so the first one, consensus methods. So this consensus means, uh, method means, uses the pool experience of senior and or middle managers to estimate the total project duration and cost. That means you get a group of people, very experienced senior managers, to give the amount, okay? So these are the estimator, senior. Senior people who really, uh, got experience in doing estimation. A meeting is held and experts discuss, argue, and ultimately reach a decision as to their best guess estimate. Then after that, they call a meeting and then they decide, uh, and then argue, argue, and then they decide, okay, what is the amount? Okay, the final decision. So this is one way. There's one way under this consensus method is called the Delphi method. So this Delphi method is one of this is uh, making this macro estimates. How is this Delphi method? 
Okay, this under this Delphi method. So this Delphi was originally developed by the Rand Corporation, a company in 1969 for technological type of forecasting. So this Delphi method is a group decision process about the likelihood that certain events will occur. And the method makes use of a panel of experts familiar with the kind of project in question. So again, you see, they got a group of experts here. They are very familiar with the kind of project that you are looking at. <coughs> so now the expenses to estimate question S are anonymous and they are provided with a summary of uh, opinions. So they are given a set of the values about you know all these projects, all the things about project. And then they just go and make, they send out a question A, ask them to fill up what should be the cost for this project. So they do not know each other. They don't go and see each other. They just send out somebody in charge, a coordinator, coordinate and then send out the question A to all this uh, managerial level who is doing involved in this Delphi method. Just give me the rough estimation and then this person will compile. <coughs> so after that, experts are then encouraged to reconsider and if appropriate to change their previous estimate in light of the replies of other experts. So this coordinator compile all the feedback from all these uh, managers and then they send back to them, to the other again. Okay, these are the results. You know, this estimation by uh, manager A, manager B, manager C and so on. I send it to you, but they do not know each other. Who, who's, whose one is that? Then they look at all other people. Uh, what are the value people estimated from others? And they look at your own value. They say, oh, okay, I think I should be adjust. So this is a second round. So after two or three rounds, it is believed that the group will converge towards the best response through this consensus process. So they don't mix, they don't know each other, and only one coordinator compile all their feedback, send back to them about the decision by all the others. Then slowly they ask them to, you go and, you go and readjust, readjust. Then slowly come back a few rounds, then you come back, they almost merging towards like a more closer point now. So the big point of responses is statistically categorized by the median score. So slowly they come to a very center point. That center point will be used to become the estimate. So in each succeeding round of question S, the range of responses by the panelists will presumably decrease. You see, the difference will become smaller and smaller, and the median will move toward what is deemed to be the correct estimate, assumed moving towards the center point. They will assume that this center point will be a correct estimation. So the advantage of this method is that the experts never need to be brought together physically. They are no, no meeting. Okay, They don't see each other. Uh, it's just like COVID-19, everything online like that. So the process also does not require complete agreement by all panelists. No need everyone to decision making. So because they are taking the center point, since the majority opinion is represented by the median value, see, so it's not a one person's value. It's like everybody uh, uh, value estimated and moving towards the median, I take the median value. So it's no one person's uh, decision. Okay, so that is called the good thing about Delphi method. No need to see each other and save the cost of traveling. Second method is called the ratio method. <coughs> so this is a micro method and sometimes called also known as parametric. Uh, usually top down and use they use ratio to estimate the project times or cost. So these micro approaches are often used in the concept of need phase. That means at the beginning phase of a project to get an initial duration and cost estimate for the project. So at the start of the project, give me a rough value. What is it? How long is going to take and how much overall about this project cost? It's at the inception, conception phase, you know, at the beginning of the phase only. So you use this approach. So examples of this ratio method. So let's say the cost for a new plant. So you want to build a new factory based on cost per square foot. So this is 2,700 square feet. Multiply, let's say the per square foot is how much? It's Ringgit Malaysia, 120 square foot. Then it gives you 2,700 multiplied by uh, Ringgit Malaysia, 120, you get 3 to 4,000 Ringgit Malaysia. So this is estimated, you see, you start at the start, you just give a rough estimation by capacity size. And it's a software, similarly for software product, is estimated by features and complexity. We'll come to this shortly, okay, which is the function points, right? So this is give me a overall a rough value first using ratio methods. a portion method under the top-down approach. So this method is an extension to the ratio method. Apportionment is used when projects closely follow past projects in features and costs. Given good historical data, estimates can be made quickly with little effort and reasonable accuracy. And this method is very common in projects that are relatively standard 
but has some small variations or customization. So that means this apportion method you base on historical project, the past project that have similar nature or feature of your current project. So you just make some changes to adjust the cost and then it becomes your new cost based on the historical project that is similar to your current project. So you just make some changes, slight changes only. Then it will be easy for you to make the accurate uh, estimation and also quite accurate because you based on historical project that is similar to your current project. So how you do a portion method? So this is the way to do it. So this is an example of a portion method of allocating project costs using the WBS work breakdown software. So you can this you can see this is the form of a WBS. This is the total project cost. How you get to this? So this allocated the five hundred thousand. You break it down into the design, the program, the test, document, produce, CD. So under each design, you have a, a sub of this design one and design two. Program you have P one, P two, P three. Test you break down into T one, T two, T three. Document you have document one, document two. Uh, produce CD only one. Okay, CD one. So you break down this into percentage. Design is this is total is five hundred thousand. You apportion method. You break it down. Design you allocated twenty percent. Program thirty percent, forty percent, five percent, five percent, and so on. So you can see this total amount. So twenty percent of five hundred thousand is one hundred thousand. Thirty percent of five hundred thousand will be hundred and fifty thousand. You see. So this is the second level. The highest level is the total cost. This is the second level. So now look at this uh, design. Under design, you see you break down some more. This twenty thousand, you break down the D one, D two, which is a ten percent each. Now you be careful uh, when you do the calculation. You don't want to take the ten percent from here, multiply by this amount. So this ten percent, you still take this ten percent, multiply by this original amount. Okay, don't go and out multiply ten percent with the 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 level above it. It will be incorrect. So you have to multiply ten percent with the total project cost. Instead of the the level which is just above the design twenty percent, your value will be incorrect. So you have to multiply ten percent, multiply by the total cost, then it's fifty thousand for D one, and then also fifty thousand for D two. So same goes for let's say the program and test. So test you divided into forty forty percent of the total cost, which is two hundred thousand. Your T one is ten percent. Don't go and multiply ten percent of the two hundred thousand. You have to multiply ten percent of the total project cost. Same thing with T two, also ten percent of the total project cost, and T three twenty percent of the total project cost. You understand? So make sure you don't do uh, just the highest level. Go and don't multiply percentage with the, just the highest level. It's incorrect answer. You should multiply always to the highest level, the total project cost. Okay, understand? So this method is called a portion method. Next is about the function point. It's about software development. So the function point method for software and system projects. So this is very common. So in software industry, software development projects are frequently estimated using weighted macro variables called function points, or major parameters such as number of inputs, outputs, inquiries, data files, and interfaces. So in the olden days, people like to use this approach. So they define the uh, software development into what are the inputs you have and how many inputs you have, how many outputs you produce, and how many inquiry statement you produce, and how many data files you need, and then what are the interfaces. So by counting the number of this uh this kind of uh, inputs output and so on, and then you multiply with the weightage, okay, the weight, okay. So these weights, weighted variables are adjusted for complexity. It means how complicated the interface is, how complicated are the input, how complicated are this output and inquiry data file and so on. So you multiply weightage to represent its complexity, and then you go and add up all these values. So the total adjusted count provides the basis for estimating the labor effort and cost for a project. So after you get the function point, and then you go and calculate how many labor hours, how many, how much effort from the labor you require to complete the software development. Okay, now you look at one example here. You can see in this table here, these are the elements. So they are the inputs, outputs, inquiries, files, and then the interfaces. Okay, these are the five elements here. And then just now already mentioned, you give the weightage, the complexity weighting, if whether it is low complexity. Every complexity high and so on. So for inputs, if low is you have to multiply by two times. If it is average complexity, multiply by three. High will be four. And then for outputs is three, six, nine. If uh the weightage for inquiries will be two, four, six. And then the file will be five, eight, twelve. And then last one interface is five, ten, and fifteen. So this value is always set by expert. Uh, okay. So it's the expert call average. 
he designed all this okay then we just multiply he allocated this is complexity he assigned he recommended this one so you do what you need to do is okay you look at the question now so let's say you have a software project team this is a called the patient admitting and view billing so let's say this is one of the module okay in the let's say hospital management system inside this module here let's say you have inputs there are 15 of inputs you got outputs there are five, uh, five outputs you got inquiries 10 files got 30 and then interfaces got 20. now here these inputs they are rated complexity as low so low just now you see just now that screen you can see for low you multiply by two you see remember if it is low input complexity multiply by two right so you just follow that table then if low put the two here complexity for output is average multiply by six complexity for inquiry is average multiply by four and the complexity is high for file multiply by 12 and complexity for interfaces is average multiplied by 10. so now you put this in table form application or complexity all the the different five types of elements here how many count here multiply by the complexity and then after that you sum them up so now you get the total of 660 so this is called six, 660 function points this is known as function points okay so after that you can use that function point and go and calculate how many man hours you need how many man hours the effort that you need to carry out the software project development okay the last one is called learning curve under the macro approaches so some projects require that the same task or group of tasks or product be repeated several times you keep on repeating the same job again and again managers know intuitively that the time to perform a task improves with repetition see the more you practice practice makes perfect you're getting better and better and become very skillful so this phenomenon is especially true of tasks that are labor intensive see so if the person is doing manual you see is you manually it's a labor one so the labor job the person who's let's say you know uh you know doing packaging you first you do packaging you pack you know let's say a, a uh, you're packing uh you know the, the the cupcakes okay you do packaging packing so every day you do 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 you become faster and faster and become very skillful you see so this is called learning curve understand so the pattern of improvement phenomenon can be used to predict the reduction in time to perform the task because you become faster and faster the time to finish your ta task become reduced task so after doing it many times you get become faster and faster so the time to finish your task become greatly reduced because you have become very skillful so that's called how much time you really learn spend on learning and become so good so the pattern of this improvement has been quantified in the learning curve so this term is called learning curve and also known as improvement curve you see you're improving or experience curve and industrial progress curve you see improving because you keep on practicing which is described by the relationship there's one phrase it says that each time the output quantity doubles every time you double the output let's say you produce two two bags now become four bags okay the unit labor hours are reduced at a constant rate so the first time maybe you need 10 hours then after you can produce okay two units you produce then you become you produce four units the 10 hours become reduced to let's say nine hours then next you produce uh, four units become eight units okay of output you produce then you reduce another one hour become eight hours so it will reduce in the constant rate of course up to a certain uh to a limit then you cannot reduce anymore because that's your maximum performance you can achieve then you stop there okay so as you go along practice uh, a lot a lot and then you can reduce to a certain hours of the task time and up to a certain maximum point you cannot improve anymore and that becomes stop there okay so that's called learning curve Okay, so that's all about the macro approaches. Next, we are going to learn about micro approaches. Micro approaches also known as bottom-up approaches. So here, the methods you're going to learn include template method, parametric procedures applied to specific tasks, detailed estimates for the WBS work packages, and then the last one is called phase estimating using a hybrid approach. So we look at the first one, template method. So if a project is similar to the past projects, the cost from the past projects can be used as a starting point for the new project. So that means, again, you look at the past projects uh, report and look at how much the cost estimated similar to your current project. So based on the historical report, the historical project that people have done, you can do the estimation very fast. 
So differences in the new project can be noted. You see, your, your project is different from the old project. In what way? What are the differences there? And the past times and costs adjusted to reflect these differences. So what are the new things that you have people don't have? What are the things that people have you also have? Uh, so you can take the values that they estimated. So this approach enables the firm to develop a potential schedule, to estimate the cost, and develop a budget in a very short time span. So very fast, you can come up with a quite an accurate uh, estimates for your time and also the cost for your project based on the past project, which is quite similar to your one, and you just change some changes made according to your new needs. So development of such templates in the database can quickly reduce estimate errors. So of course, they documented there's a database document all the past projects records how they estimate each WPs and so on. You based on those the previous data you retrieve from their database and then you compare with your current one. You make some adjustment and then you come up with your new values. Next is the parametric procedure applied to specific tasks. So just as parametric techniques such as the cost per square foot can be the source of macro estimates. The same technique can be applied to specific tasks. So example, as part of an MS Office 2000 conversion project, 36 different computer workstations needed to be converted. So it means you're upgrading uh, to MS Office 2000. So based on past conversion projects, the project manager determined that on average, one person could convert three workstations per day. So therefore, the task of converting, you have 36 workstations, it will take you three technicians for four days. So that is 36 divided by three over divided by three. So you will get three technicians. So for you, allow you to estimate how many people you need with the expertise or the time allocated based on the past project experience. Okay, so next is about detailed estimates for the WBS work packages. So this is the most reliable method for estimating time and cost is to use WBS and to ask the people responsible for the work package to meet the estimates. So the person who owns the WP ask the owner to meet the estimate. Not the person is going to own the task, going to carry out the task. The person know, the person will know very well how much time you need and how much cost to finish the task. When work packages have significant uncertainty associated with the time to complete, which is a prudent, that means you need to be very careful. Use a careful policy to require three time estimates which is low, average, and high. It's just like, what is the lowest value? What is the highest value? And what should be the average value to carry out the task within the certain time or within the certain cost? You get three values instead of one value. Okay. If you need a very accurate, you're afraid that uh, accuracy cannot be achieved if using one value only. And also you use more than one estimator. So you have three estimators here in this example here. SP45 support cost estimate worksheet here. In this project number 17, okay, so about road uh, diversion project here. And then this is the project manager. And this, this is the date, okay, of doing the estimation. So you got, instead of one estimator, you have three estimators. So the first estimator not only give one value, but give three sets of values. What is the lowest cost? What will be the highest cost? What should be the average cost? And then uh, also, like, let's say the days and how long, okay? The number of days. You give three sets of value. Everything all give three sets of value by one estimator. So all together, each three sets, three sets by three estimators. And after that, you take the average of all the three sets of value. Average of the lowest value, average of the highest value, and average of the every set of values. Then from there, you decide which one you want to take. So usually, people will take the center one. The average of all the average values, you understand? To be on the safe side. So because you, are, you don't believe that the estimator can give you a good estimation, then you ask more than one estimator, and each estimator also give you more than one set of estimated values. Okay. So next, the last approach is called the phase estimating, which is known as a hybrid approach. means mixture of macro and micro approaches. So this approach begins with a macro estimate for the project, and then refines, estimates for phases of the project as it is implemented. You start with the macro approach. When you assign the project, give a macro estimate, a total rough estimate for the whole project. Some projects by their nature cannot be rigorously defined because of the uncertainty of design or the final product. Sometimes you cannot tell. I just don't know how to estimate. I got no idea how to do estimation. So in this case, you use this hybrid approach. Although rare, such projects do exist such as aerospace projects, IT projects, 
new technology projects and construction projects where design is incomplete because you have to come for, from one phase to another phase. You're not sure what is next phase going to cost you. So you have to give uh, using this kind of rough estimation at the beginning. When you're moving towards that particular phase, you can see that phase clearer. Then you can give a more accurate estimation for that particular phase. You will apply micro approach. So that's why it's called hybrid means mixture of using combination of macro and micro approaches here. So in these projects, the phase or life cycle estimating is frequently used. Okay, so this is how it looks like. So for example here, you see this is the phase estimating over the product life cycle. For example, first phase is the need. You identify what are the needs or specification. Then followed by specification, uh, the actual specification, the phase two, design phase number three, produce four, and then deliver phase five. So at the phase one, the first phase, then you do a macro estimate because the whole picture, I cannot see the whole thing yet. So I use macro approaches to give an overall, a quick estimation of the whole project. So next, when I move on to the actual phase now, the specification, then during this phase, I do a detailed estimate using micro approaches. So the remaining one, I still cannot see a clear picture how much I need. So I apply the remaining phases will be using macro estimate. So you have combination here, a detailed estimate plus the uh, rough estimate, which is the top down. Okay, this is the top down. This is the bottom up is the detail. Top down is the uh, rough estimate. Micro plus macro. So next, you go down to the next phase is the design phase. During that phase, you can see the, the picture very clearly about what you need, what you need to do and the cost you require to carry out the phase of the task there. So you apply detailed estimate. Then the remaining phase still cannot see a good picture. Then you do a macro approach. So again, you have the micro macro approach together. Next, the last one. Okay, detail macro. And then the last one, you come to detail. Okay, so you can see a combination of micro approach, macro approach. First, you start with uh, macro first. Then the micro plus macro, micro macro. So you have the mixture of both. So this is called the term hybrid approach. That means combination of both types. So this is the best if you are not sure, not clear of the project you are doing, and you will only be see the detail when you come to a particular phase, uh, especially for software development. Now, this one here is shows the top down, the micro macro, the estimates the differences between the two. So this is the top down estimates, okay, and this is the bottom up estimates. So what is it intended use for? Uh, for this top down here, feasibility, conceptual phase, rough time, uh, cost estimate the fund requirements, a resource capacity planning. So it's a rough value. For intended use for the bottom up, it's used for budgeting, scheduling, resource requirements, and the fund timing, very more detailed one. So the preparation of the cost time is one over 10 to three over 10 of a percent of total project cost. But the preparation cost for doing the micro approach will be three over 10 of a percent to 1% of the total project cost. That's the, the preparation cost that we require to do the bottom up approach. So accuracy of using top-down approach will be a minus 20% to uh, accuracy of plus 60%. Accuracy for micro approach, more accuracy, is minus 10% up to 30%, 30 uh, 30 but this one should be higher. I think this one is something wrong here. So the bot uh, bottom-up should be more accurate. Okay, All right. So the method here, consensus, ratio, apportion, function point, and learning are all under top-down. And micro here will be template, parametric, WBS, packages and the uh, range estimates. Okay, did I miss something? Uh? Okay, I think uh, next one, next one. Okay. okay. Level of detail. So when you have WBS, how deep you should break down or you have PBS, how deep you should break down how many levels? It depends because it depends how complicated is the project is. So the more complicated or the larger size the project is, of course, more detail, you have to break down the levels. But the good, uh, the guideline is, that's why one, one of the students sent me a question in the email asking, how many levels should I break down and how should I draw the different levels? It's become very complicated. And one sheet of A4 paper, I cannot uh, accommodate the, all the boxes inside there. You see the breakdown structure here. So it becomes like very messy. How, how can I do that? See, so there's a question asked. So later I'm going to explain. So how detailed is this? Depending on how complicated is the project is, okay? And all the different levels and how many tasks you have. So level of details in the WBS varies with the complexity of the project itself. And also there's a guideline. Usually people 
I will suggest the guideline is a uh, five, five levels, about five levels or less than that, or the most five plus two, okay, or five minus two. So three to five levels. The most is uh, seven levels, but not more than that. Then it become very messy, right? So next, you should take note uh, some uh, issues here. One is about excessive detail. If you do very detail, break down many, many levels, then it is very complicated and it is very costly. So this focuses a focus on the on departmental outcomes. So if you are different levels of WBS break down into very deep, deep levels, then it becomes you are focusing on which department will do the task rather than what kind of deliverable you are going to produce. So next, if you do too deep down many levels, this one also going to create unproductive paperwork because you break down many, many. So a lot of things you have to write about each level. So, but if you are doing insufficient detail, very few levels, that is also going to be costly. Why? Because you lack of focus on the goals. That means too brief. The person who assign the lowest level say, oh, that, that's it. You're going to do the job. But actually, the person still not clear. I don't know what to do. You see, I don't know what is the objective you mean to achieve. So insufficient detail is also costly. So it will be wasted effort on non-essential activity because the person not sure. It's just like that day, uh, one of the team leaders asking me about uh, if I break down, you know, the HOTS, okay, the, the breakdown of the design of HOTS. You see, I just say design HOTS assessment question. Is it enough? Uh, I say, maybe to you, you feel that it's enough. To other people, you will assign the task to someone to do the person. Feel, I don't understand. I don't know what to do. You see, the person will do something else. But if you break down some more, design the HOTS assessment question, you break down into different components. So I have component creativity. I have component, uh, this is uh, problem solving. And I have the meta condition and so on. So, so I know, oh, okay, uh, the one I focus is uh, problem solving. So I know I only focusing on question about problem solving and not other things, you see? So the person is become clearer. So and another one I say, is it enough? Uh, then maybe say, oh, no, no, I have to break down some more. So next I have to break down is uh, within this one, you have to have three questions. Uh, then I know how many questions I should set, you see? If I don't set the number of questions, the person going to do a lot or don't do, you see? Oh, okay, okay, I just set one question. Oh, I said 10, 10 questions, you see? So how how detailed you should have if it is clear enough then you stop okay understand so not too deep also not too uh, brief this is the one okay which i want to mention so this is the work package estimate which i mentioned earlier in the previous lecture you have to do in your cost estimation uh, section 3.3 you need to do this because you have to do this in order to do a latest chapter which is uh, one apart in chapter 5 which is a uh, project progress monitoring the project mo uh, process mo monitoring require this WP estimate. So if you don't do now, later if you come to chapter five, if you if you are not going to prepare this now, you are going to come back and redo this one. So I advise you all the project teams to do all this now. Okay, you have to do this WP work esti uh, WP estimates. So you break down your whether your WBS or PBS. You break down to the lowest level, which is called the WP. You allocate the time and cost for this WP. Understand? So you break down into what's the salary, the person doing this uh, WP, what are the equipment material costs to help this person to finish this task. And then you sum up. So that is the cost and budget and the time required for finishing one WP. So you look at your diagram. You got how many WPs? One WP, one sheet. Uh, maybe this one, this one is one page. You need one page. If that WP needs a lot of things, then it may have two pages and so on, okay? But usually, I think one page should be enough. The most, I think, two pages, okay, of this WP estimates. You do this for each of your WP in your WBS or in your PBS diagram, okay? Make sure you do this, huh? So this is the, this is micro approach, huh? Based on WP estimate is a micro approach. So if you want to do just now recommended, the best way to do cost estimation, you start with macro. That means you can give a rough estimation of the overall project cost and then you do this detail. And then after that, you reconcile. So you see what is the balance out, okay? If there's a big difference between the your top-down approach and the bottom-up approach, the uh, cost estimated, there are big difference. Then you do some uh, adjustment. So next, we come to the different types of costs. So the, the cost can be divided into, classified into direct costs, direct project overhead costs, and general and administrative overhead costs. So what is direct cost? So direct cost means the cost that are clearly chargeable to a specific work package. That means that lowest level of WP, you charge to that WP. For example, labor, the person, the labor doing that, just now you see that, that shape of uh, this here, this one here, this part here. 
this labor cost here, these are direct costs. You can see the term here. You can see this corner here, direct cost. So you have the direct cost to pay the salary for doing coding, document, publish, and so on. So this is called direct cost. The labor who is doing the WP. Then what are the materials? That's how you see the, the form there. The materials, equipment needed, and other things to finish that WP. Next is the direct project overhead cost. These costs incurred that are directly tied to an identifiable project variables or work package. So, for example, this salary is the salary of project manager. The project manager who control the whole project, who look at the whole project, all the variables of each phase. Okay, it can be the renters. The rent you pay uh, to have a space to carry out the project. <coughs> you have suppliers, okay, people who supply material to finish a certain project variables. And certain type of specialized machines, okay, machineries that you require to finish that uh, project variables, okay. So these are all direct project overhead costs. So this, the different from this with direct cost, the first direct cost is the person actually carry out that particular specific WP. This one is a, a bit higher level, okay. Next is the general and administrative overhead cost. So organization costs indirectly linked to a specific package that are a portion distributed to the project. So to calculate general and administrative overhead costs, this amount is usually a percentage of the total uh, sum of these direct costs and direct project overhead costs, and you sign a percentage. So 10%, 20% of this direct and the direct project overhead cost, the sum of these two, and then assign a percentage. So this covers general and administrative overhead costs, covers the uh, advertising, okay? Accounting cost and usually as a percent, you see, of the total direct cost of some of this, okay, some of the, the above two. So, this is an example here a uh, contract, a project that go for a bid, okay, contract bid summary cost. So, let's say, let's say the, the cost itself, the direct cost is $80,000, direct overhead cost is $20,000. So, the sum of this is $100,000. So, the G and, H, G and A overhead will be 20%. <coughs> So 20% of 100,000 is 20,000. So you are going for a bid. You see, it's a contract project. And of course, you want to earn profit. You assign 20% of this. So you get 24,000. <coughs> so the total bid will be $144,000. Okay. <coughs> now, next. There are three views of cost. Okay. One is called the committed cost. One is called actual cost. This line is the actual cost, the circle view one, okay, red one. And also another one is a schedule budget, the square, empty square. And one is the committed, is the round, but then uh, inside is blank. Now you look at these three types of cost. So what are these three types of cost? So you see the actual cost, this is the lowest level. So actual cost you allocated, so you know what is the actual amount, the actual cost you need to spend. It's just like your study. So what is the actual tuition fees? That's your actual cost. But when you have you schedule budget, when you allocate, when you go and study in your okay, you in your study, when you come to that certain point that you need to pay fees, so you don't go and just assign allocated exactly the amount. You will have scheduled some budget which is more than that amount. You may have something cost more, okay, that you need to pay for that, not only just the tuition fee. There could be something other things that you require. Right. Okay. So next you have the committed fees. Maybe on top of the tuition fees that you have to pay examination fees. So those are the fees that you are required to pay. Okay. You got no choice but to pay. Right. So this will be higher. So add up all this will be committed costs will be higher than the other two lines. So it's just like, for example, <coughs> actually I just had two surgeries recently. So I have uh I have to go for my cataract surgeries. So for my both eyes. So you see the cost, the actual cost to do my surgery, one eyes is two thousand two. So that's my actual cost. So of course I cannot just allocate exactly two thousand two for my surgery for one eyes and then the other eyes total will be four thousand four thousand four hundred. Okay. So I cannot just allocate actual cost. I will have to schedule the budget. You see for my surgery here uh, because the surgery you see it, I, I do it uh, one one eye source and I do the second eyes so and then as we go along then the cost incurred you see I had to schedule more 
because not just the, the surgery alone is 2002. But after that, I have to apply the eye drop. You see, the other things. I have to buy the cotton to clean my eyes and so on. So I have to other things. I have to, you know, besides the surgery itself, I have to budget, allocate the schedule budget for more. I should go along after uh, 10 days later and I go for my uh, another eyes uh, surgery. See, so I have to allocate the schedule budget, which is slightly more than what is then later than another committed cost. Because of this COVID-19, the eye specialist, when I went for my surgery, they say, you know, before you have your surgery, because it's a close contact, right? It's a, there's a physical contact. They're touching me, right? They're, they're touching on my eyes here. Then there's a close contact. Then afraid that maybe I'm COVID, maybe I'm COVID positive. You see, I'm not sure. So before the operation, they require me to undergo a test, COVID-19 test. So they have a type of a simple blood test. So you see, they say you have to pay for this committed. You must pay for this COVID-19 uh, blood test before I do the operation on you. So I have to pay for that COVID-19 blood test, which cost me 60 ringgit, you see. So I committed another cost, which is must pay. If not, they are not going to do the operation for me. So they see, it add up with all the costs, then become committed cost is more than the what is the actual cost. Okay, so that's how the lines looks like. So what is the actual cost? Then what you budgeted will be something else. And every time I go, I have to call. I cannot drive. And then I have to call a grab car. Uh, that is also committed. I got no choice which amount that I have to pay one. So that is called the committed cost. So all the uh, amount sum up together, then your committed cost will be the highest, right? Then the other two. Okay, understand now? The differences between the committed actual cost and the scheduled budget. Okay, next. Uh, refining estimates. The reason for estimates adjusting the estimates so interaction costs are hidden in estimates so when you do the estimates you see because they got different departments involved you have to communicate uh, passing messages you know talking discussion with each other these are interaction but we never consider that interaction is part of the cost so it's hidden it's never considered so that's the reason of you have to sometimes have to adjust the readjust the estimation that you make and then normal conditions do not apply. Just now, the guide, guideline says that you apply normal conditions. Don't assume something going to happen to uh, that task or to the staff doing the task. You assume everything is normal. But actually, normal things never, never will carry out as normal. It will be like some, something urgency thing, something unexpected uh, incident that going to happen as you go along your project. So, but you assume that first. Okay, so that's why later when you have something happen, you have to readjust your estimate that you made earlier. That's why I say, Sometimes no good to do very detailed because something happened later, you have to re redo the whole of the time estimation. So things go wrong on projects. You see, it's just like equipment breakdown. Then something happened. You do not know unexpected thing. You know, it won't go so smoothly one. So, but if things happen, then of course something happened will cost you more. You have to readjust the project cost. Changes in project scope and plans. So you see, customer come and say, hey, I, I want to change the scope. It's just like, you know our project, you see, remember uh, one the about the game one? Then the game one of the group say that and then we remove this question and then suddenly another go kind of tell me, say, hey, no, no, no. I know my literature review is talking all about, you know, this computer game also on the mobile thing because other literature don't have about desktop thing, you know. Uh, can I just, just keep that and then can I also keep that question? You see, we keep on changing, you see. So the changes in the project scope and the plan will affect your project cost estimation and the time estimation. See, change is you have to anticipate. Change happening every day, okay. So next, adjusting your estimates. The time and cost estimates of specific activities are adjusted as the risk, resources, and situation particulars become more clearly defined. See? So that's why, because when you do estimation, you are not clear at the beginning. When you come to a specific phase, a certain activity, you start to see what is happening and what are the risks that is happening now and what are the resources you have uh, that you can use at the moment, that at this moment now. Then you see things clearer, you can do a more accurate estimate. In this case, you need to re-estimate. You know, whatever you estimated earlier become like not so realistic, not so good. Then you have to readjust, you re-estimate all over again. Okay. So that's the reason why sometimes just enough, enough. No need to do a so detail, right? So next, contingency funds and time buffer. Uh, that's what I mentioned just now. You see. Uh, unexpected risk going to happen. So because of that unexpected uh, incident happen, then you apply a fund called contingency funds. Okay, these are created independently to offset uncertainty. See, there are uncertain things, uh, things that risk happen. You do not expect certain things to happen. 
So you allocate a sum. This amount is called contingency fund to cover whatever the unexpected incident happened to you that's going to cost you more money. And you also allocate more time. That's called the time buffers. So this reduces the likelihood of cost and completion time overruns for a project. You see, on, on top of uh, doing a normal estimate, you allocate a sum for contingency use. You allocate some extra time for emergency use. So that will reduce that you suddenly get, oh, oh my God, my project is uh, over cost. Now it's exceeding the time limit because you really cater for one sum. That if something happens, I will use this sum to cover, you know, whatever the unexpected incident that I have to attend to. Right? So it can be added to the overall project or to specific activities or work packages. So this sum, this contingency fund, it can be just a sum added to the total project or it can be just one a sum that added to that particular activity or to that one particular WP. If it, oh, this WP, I think, got some kind of risk. So allocate a small fund or condition fund for this WP. On uh, this overall project, there'll be some risk going to happen. So I allocate one sum for this whole project's contingency fund. It can be for the whole project or one specific task or one specific activity. So up to you to decide. Okay, Can be determined from previous similar projects. See, you got no idea. It, actually, how much uh, to uh, allocate contingency fund for my project? You're not sure. Again, you go and look at the historical project report. The past project record that doing the same project like what you're doing now. So it's just like, oh, you're doing C-test. C-test, what kind of possible risk going to happen? I do not know. But there were previous year students have done this project. Then I refer to previous year report and got idea. Then I know how to allocate what is the total amount of contingency fund and how much extra time buffer I should allocate for this current, this year's C-test. You understand? So it's all based on the past uh, historical report. Next, changing baseline schedule and budget. You see, so whatever you already estimated, the amount or the time you uh, already estimated, these are known as baseline. Okay, that means this is the basic, the, the uh, fundamental one that you already set. So unforeseen events may detect a reformulation of the budget and schedule. You see, so because the, a lot of unforeseen, that means the risk event that happened will require you, you see, go and redo and go and readjust all the budget and also reschedule how much money for each task and what is the uh, total cost for the whole project, what is the total time for this project. You have to revise it and then make some changes. So, of course, you cannot say, oh, if there's something changed, I also change. You change, you cannot simply change as you like. Huh? There's a system called change management system, and this one will be covered in the risk management chapter. So, that means if you want to go, go through a change in your cost estimation, you reset this is amount, but later you want to adjust the amount to maybe increase it, but you cannot simply increase without a process called the change management process. I mean, some parties are higher level authority should be, you apply for permission and then permission granted, then you're allowed to make the change. Okay, so this is all change management. Okay, so that's all for this, uh, today's uh, cost estimation and time estimation. So these are the key terms. Any questions so far? Any question? No, no. Okay. Uh, so, as I mentioned just now, I require all students to use the WP work packages. Uh, you understand? Make sure of you use that one. Uh, because that one yes, is needed. Uh, if you, use, you want to use, if you want to learn uh, macro, other micro, you can use. But that one is needed. That one, minimum you have to do that one. Okay, any questions so far? If if no, okay, uh, let me go through this. I, um, Class that day, I'm supposed to go through a one survey form in building tutorial class because not enough time. You see, we got too many questions. So I mentioned that I will discuss it here and also good to share with all of you so that all of you don't make the same mistakes in the survey design. Okay, actually, I uploaded the file. I uploaded the file to the... Um, you go to the file, you can see the file. There's a file there. Let me sort the screen. Uh. Let me see. Mm, let me see where is it. Oh dear, missing. Can you go to open that file? You go to the file, you can see a file called. Let me see. Uh, there's called survey form. There's one survey form TG2 T6. Can you find the file, PDF file? Go to files and you download that one. Yes, doctor. Uh, you open the file. Okay. Let me go through. Uh. Uh, yes, doctor. Yeah, I, I suppose the, all the team members of TG2, T6 are here. Yes. Leader of TG2, T6 at least. All the team members here. 
Okay, I want to go through this. Uh. Can you see the survey form? I think from my screen, I think you cannot see right from my screen. I have to get out, I think. Because when uh, the, my screen cannot see this. Uh, let, let, let me let me let me come go out and leave and then I'll come back in again and I show the screen. Okay, uh, before that, this this one is the, can you see this uh, word file? Can you see the... the no. Huh? I cannot huh? see. Okay, let me, let me stop again. Okay, let me try again. Can you see now? No. Still no. Okay, no comment. Never mind. It's okay. Uh, can you see this, this word file? The PDF. Yes. Sir. Yes. Okay. This is the survey yes. form done by uh T G T G two T six ah. Huh? Okay. So I, I I hope the teams are here. So this one is the survey form. Uh, conduct a question and survey to analyze the attitude of university students in course assessment C test. Okay. The C test project. Okay. My question is uh the T two T G two T six ah. Huh? Why you put a, a Chinese word here? Uh? Why, why you why you put a Chinese word here? Can can I understand this one? Why what's the purpose? TG two T six. Can you under can you please answer my question? Or whoever uh, designed this survey form, can you please answer my question? Why you put the uh, Chinese word there in red? Yeah? TG two T six. Anyone leader here? Nobody from TG two T six. Yes, madam. Yeah, can can you please answer my question? Why you put a uh, this red color Chinese text here? Um. Doctor, I believe this is localization of the, like, the Google account. Yeah, it's your cookie. Uh, it's your cookie, yeah. doctor. Uh, if based on your cookie, your preferred language may be Language, like Chinese, yeah. And it shows Chinese there. Actually, there's no Chinese here. Ah, you mean in your uh, file, a Chinese one? Ah? Yeah, there's because if we, if we public access it, the words in Chinese there would automatically translate into like English or any like preferred language that you use in your browser. Your browser preferred language. Oh, I see. So I, right. I was wondering why some are in, in Chinese. <laughs> oh, yeah. If I change my preferred language to English, then you will write a uh, uh, required there. Oh, but I think I put... Uh, I, I all the while I use uh, English. <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> Okay, okay, never mind. Okay, so that means something wrong is my side. Okay, so your one is all in English. There's no Chinese there. Uh, be, because I should transfer the the Google form to PDF. Then, then the, if I change my browser preferred English, they will change to English. Yeah, that's why I, I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised because you send me in PDF. How, how can you convert to become a Chinese uh, character? It shouldn't be right. Because Google Form they got 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 tools that can straight away uh tran transfer the the form to PDF. Okay, but it it, it convert to PDF it it straight away 
converted to this Chinese language or during conversion or I receive my is from my uh, browser converted to become Chinese? Uh, no, it's my problem because I my browser preferred language is Chinese. Yeah, that's why I was I thought I was so puzzled. You say it's my site. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> okay. oh. oh, I use English. Okay? okay, so can you give me the the correct version? Because I'm very confused by this. You see, when I'm looking at okay. it, I don't. Again, again. Uh, can, can you give me uh, uh, okay. That's why you see, you okay. have to be careful. Is it now? Now I don't know whatever it is. So you have to be careful when you send out this to your respondent. So will the respondent receive this or not? Okay. So uh, no, no, no. He, uh, the respondent will receive their their preferred language. Yeah, the English one, ah. Uh. Ah, uh, like in like the 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 in the word in red color they were right. Uh, required. Uh, okay, 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 okay. So maybe you, you should send me a, a, a better okay. version because now I'm, I'm very confused by all these things. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, so maybe we, we just ignore the, the Chinese characters, okay? So uh, assuming that one is in English is required few, right? Required to answer few. So now you have this uh, metric number, uh, the old one and the new one, and then your age group, okay? These, these are all fine, right? So next you have year of study. So again, this one the Chinese should be in a uh, choose one option only, right? Okay. And next, uh, this question is fine. Gender is okay. Next, uh, ethnic group will be okay. Ah, uh, so uh, this Chinese word here means the other. Okay. So you have to fill in. Uh. So uh, I I just want to some of you to take note. If the person choose the option other, make sure the person uh, fill in this blank here because some of the survey form that uh some of you other teams have sent to me, I tested. Some of their feel, you know, when they choose other, sometimes is I must fill in. Sometimes if I don't fill in, it's okay. So make sure you set. If this is other, make sure they all fill in this. Don't leave it blank, right? So take note. So same with this, okay? If others, then you put this. Uh, I remember nationality. I put besides Malaysian, I got other nationalities, right? But you just keep. You just put Malaysian and then others and ask people to fill in. So you want to cut short this question. I, I put some others is because if you know that the respondents majority, let's say they are from, uh, let's say they are from Iran, so you put Iranian. Okay, let's say most of your uh, respondents they could be from Pakistan, Pakistani, you know. Then you put uh, those other majority. Uh, let's say many of the respondents they are from China. Okay, then you put the Chinese here uh, from China, then bracket China, something like that. You understand? So that means is to ease uh, the answering process. They just tick tick tick. Instead of they go and type, you understand? You provide some options that you think most of them will be choosing that option. You put a few, then only you leave others in case uh, one of the respondents, the list there is not their nationality. Okay, now? Okay, next, a uh, level of study. Ah, this is the question I want to ask. So, do you need to put level of study? My question is you want to collect the data from undergraduate and both postgraduate or only undergraduate? You plan to collect data from postgraduates as well? Yes or no? TG2, T6? Can I have your answer? Uh, madam, I think we are not going to take the respondent from postgraduate. Yeah. So in that case, just remove this question, okay? Okay. Ah, uh, drop this question eight. Ah, uh, come to this one. So you put a latest GPA and CGPA semester two, uh, semester two, two zero one nine, twenty twenty academic session. Now, GPA, CGPA may not be the same, right? If you provide one set, then it should be GPA or unless GPA and CGPA they are the same, but it could be different, right? Uh, yeah. Ah, so you should put one top there, this is GPA, another set there is CGPA. You understand? understand. Okay. Ah, so you got uh, the, the one heading for here, GPA, another same set here, but CGPA uh, uh, the heading, and then uh, this set of value here. Okay, yeah? Uh, so you see, you, you have to see what are the mistakes you made right, before you send out. Because people will be, so if I got two sets of different values, hey, how, how to fill in, I don't know what to do, you see? You understand? Okay, yeah. So next, you have the department. Ah. Uh, so because of this uh, Chinese character is quite messy, I don't quite understand now. So department uh, and then you say 
Yeah, Department of uh, Physics, and then you say you jump to uh, question number 11. You, 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 I don't know. This one, if you, if you let's say convert to English, uh, means after Department of Physics, then you jump to question 11. So what is question 11? Question 11 is the major. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so that means after that, you ask the person to, to go and proceed to question 11. So if this one, the second uh, no, one... The, no, madam. Uh, in, this, in this is a Google form, then if you choose that they choose view for example in the in a question then you change change to department of physics then after you press next you are you are straight straight to uh question in question 11. oh you will just uh, jump to the in question 11 uh, by itself others it's, question like 12 to 15 doesn't show in in your form oh okay 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 so, so that means it will just show the, the question 11 without the 12 and so on uh yeah mm, okay 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 fine Okay, that, that's good. That's good. Okay, because because now I, I'm confused. I, I don't know why is it. Okay, okay. so next one. Uh, so all this will be according to what is the department they have chosen. Right? So this one will not dis dis display, right? So and then after you they finish the department, then you'll jump to uh, section B. Uh, yeah. Hmm, okay, uh, that will be fine. Okay, that's good. That's good. Okay, uh, okay fine. Okay, uh, like this part here, you see the strong disagree. I don't know why. Uh, I don't know your font size. This one extremely small. You see or not? In this PDF file, I don't know what is your actual design in your survey form. So you should make it uh, same font size, big font size, so that people can see. Okay. Uh, but another one is: Is it good to design in that way, or you know, the 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 my survey form is I draw a line and then I draw the scale. To show you know the strong disagree disagree instead of you put one two three four five like that you draw a line and show the rating okay okay uh, so yeah. that part you need to improve all right uh, so this part is okay then. so you just choose one option only right so this part no problem yeah. uh, this is okay this is okay all are okay now okay okay so no problem so only only just now that one that uh, the question I asked about the Chinese characters and so on. Okay, any other question about your survey form? I think no. Uh. Uh, okay, yeah. so I, I think uh, finalize it and then you can proceed. Okay. Uh, question 8, that's all. Mm, okay. okay. Uh, any other questions from any other teams? Um, doctor. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I'm from TG two T five. So I've sent an email on the proposal like for the review, but it was not there. So do I need to like resend it in the latest Google Drive and email you again? Uh, actually, you, you sent to me in the email already. Yeah? Before you send yeah. to the Google. Okay, then you 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 find for me to check because I got many files to check now. <laughs> Too many. You're okay, in the okay. key. Okay. So 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 just I don't have to like email you another time, right? So I just leave it be right yeah. until I receive a reply. Yeah, yeah. If you email to me, you just wait first because I I first in first out. Okay. 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 <laughs> uh, I check one by one. Whoever sent to me first, you get the reply first. Okay, okay. Thanks, uh, doctor. Yeah, it, 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 may, it may have to wait for some time because the, all the chapters, some are quite long, you know. It will take me a long time to check, okay. Uh, because I got other things to do, like I I have to ask, our faculty to ask us to set exam question. I already set, you see, so I have to spend my time set the, the, the test two question because I'm in charge of my, you know, this course, the test two question. So, Dr. Hiro, I think he's setting the test one question now. Uh, I can tell you briefly what kind of question we are setting. I already finished setting my question, okay. So the Dr. Hiro intended to set his test one, uh, which will be uh, this month, uh, right? End of this month, 28th of November, on Saturday, one hour test. Uh, okay, so make sure that you are online uh, on Saturday. i remind you again. Uh, this one is going to have, he told me he planned to have MCQ questions. So multiple choice questions. Dr. Hyro is going to set about 45 questions, MCQ questions for his test one. Right? And then uh, the test will be this month. Uh, I think it's 28th of November, if I remember correctly. Okay? On Saturday, uh, 2 to 3 p.m. 
So make sure you log in. Uh. I, I am not sure how is he, he has not discussed with me how he's going to do the test. Is it going to he upload the whole set of question to Spectrum? And then you answer from structure from there. You just click, click the multiple choice question or what? I'm not sure. I, I don't know. He has not informed me how he's going to set, you know, how the, the mode of he's going to conduct. Or is it he upload the whole set of question? You download question, you answer in the word file, and then you submit word file or what? I'm not sure. So he has not come back to me about how uh, implementation of the test, right? For me, I decided my test. Uh, test two, I set my questions. I have two uh, questions, two main questions. Question one is fill in the blank. So five marks, there will be five questions. You need to fill in the blanks, five marks. And then second question is a solving problem, solving questions. So it's a calculation question. So it will come from one of the tutorials uh, style of questions. You understand? So uh, you're very fortunate this year because uh, Dr. Haru will set, you know, the whatever that we cover for the first uh, five, six chapters like that. And then I will cover the remaining uh, chapters, okay, before the test we have. So whatever Dr. Haru, uh, Cairo, uh, he has covered those questions, I won't set the question again. So meaning that if they say he set questions based on tutorial one, two, or maybe half or tutorial three or the whole set of tutorial three, then I won't set the questions based on tutorial one, two, three anymore. I will set the questions based on maybe a half of tutorial, a part of tutorial three, if it is uh, after, you know, the part that are in charge. And then maybe tutorial four and five. You understand? So that means it's more focused. You got less thing to study. You very focused for the test one and very focused for the test two. So you can concentrate which are the chapters we are going to test on you. Okay. So my questions only two main two big questions. The first one got uh fill in the blank, but got five sub questions. And then second question is a very uh, long questions. Is uh basically calculation. And then you have to uh, answer part by part. Okay, you understand? So second question carries more marks, 10 marks, and then first question, five marks. So one blank, one mark. Okay, and then total 15 marks from me, 15 marks from Dr. Hyro. Okay, so I'll give you more details when Dr. Hyro reset the question and it tell me how he's going to implement the test one. I will inform you. Okay, any questions so far about this test? And I think you can, you know how to uh, design survey form now so that the flow is uh, logical. And then it is clear to respondents, you provide some options. I advise you, even though you have provided, uh, let's say you have chosen certain faculties or departments, but you always put an option called others in case a respondent is going to answer, participate in your study and your option provided is not there. So the person still can participate by filling in the other option there. Is that clear now? Okay, any more questions about the survey? Uh, no. Yeah. Doctor, for the latest like addition for you, like from you, you were talking about the other section, right? Ah, uh, yes. So okay. let's say, let's mm. say, if someone that we are we haven't like fill in in the Google Docs for the selection of faculty, uh, uh let's say that he or she fill in the survey form, mm. will that uh, can that be replacing the like faculties with not like with not enough respondents? Like can we get away with it? Let's say let's say that uh we pick faculty of computer science, let's say we pick uh, CSN. Uh, okay. Uh we projected like 40 respondents. And then let's say we in the, but at the end of the day we only got like 38. So but we have like three from others. So can that cover the total num like the projected number of respondents as well? Yeah, uh, you, you mean that uh, you got, uh, let's say, uh, is, is 38 is from uh, networking and then you got three from not non uh, not networking one, right? So let, remember, yeah. if you check the list of faculties chosen by each team, I think each, uh, if your team not covered, let's say, let's say the other three are come from uh, IS department, right? There are, there are teams that uh, chosen IS department, am I right? Yeah. Uh, so my suggestion is you give these three respondents uh, feedback or this uh, survey form to the team that is doing the RS. And then if the RS collected that is from your uh, networking one, then they can pass it to you. You understand? Oh, okay. Uh, you see? So this is called like, you know, like partnership. You know, uh, that's why I say you put faculty, you provide the option other, you provide department other in case 
the one that you're do, not doing is responding to other which is not in your your targeted group then if you, you just collect them and then you give to the team that is doing that that department student so you are sharing you understand so this is called sharing partnership okay uh, so that that helps to collect more you end up with more so other team collected you don't go and throw away you just give to the team that is because i've given you the list of faculty you're chosen you know each other you're doing what faculty i'm doing what faculty right so you do what department i do what department then you share with each other then you help out each other then you finish very fast okay, okay. Uh. but doctor our survey forms are different right so we cannot uh. share to other team yeah I, I i know remember i said the faculty you put the other there the department you put the other there so the respondent may not be uh, exactly the one that you've chosen you, you chosen uh, computer networking but the student is from is department which is not in your list but then the person responded because you put the other option the person still going to uh, participate and answer your survey form so when you're collected you say oh this this one is for uh, is department uh, i'm not doing is department i know another team you see you check from my list the leader can check from the uh, faculty and the department is selected like you know or, or the other team uh, this team uh, from let's say t5 uh, or t1 is doing rs department i pass this one to the uh, t5 or t1 you see or not uh, you understand doctor, what i, mean? I uh. think what he's trying to say is like although we are in the same tutorial group but our uh because we are across different team right our design for the google form is different can we apply the Google from like the response from the Google from of the other teams to our own data. No, it, it, the, the main contents, they are the same, right? It's only the faculty and the department could be different only, right? What else can be different? Well, the set of questions, they are all the same, right? Uh, because, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think they, they were asking this because doctor actually said something like you are welcome to like modify your survey form but i think you like doctors mentioned something like the questions must be retained right ah yes the, the main one retained is only the faculty you have to customize only the department you have to change only uh madam yeah i mean i'm from the team six one then i want to ask uh just now about the scale right uh, actually, the scale, the remark of the scale, like one is for strongly disagree, they they in the same page. Mm. Yes, yes. It's seen throughout, uh, answer throughout. It's just they, they need to know once what it means. Then after that, they can answer all the questions already. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Any more questions? Ah. So my point is the, the main focus of all the c-test the question there is the standard it all same throughout it's just when you collect you know the respondent profile that one could be different only but basically they are from you need to capture they are from which faculty which department what are the majors that's all but later uh, do you know how to use spss anyone no uh, okay uh, no practical yeah, because you do not know what how to use SPSS. Because I mentioned that later you're going to retrieve this data from all your Google form, whatever you capture, and then you save into the SPSS file. So in the SPSS, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the value is, let's say the faculty, FSKTM. The faculty is faculty of languages and linguistics. It doesn't matter what is the, because basically the variable is called faculty name. So in the SPSS, you can cater for different faculties name. Uh, maybe I think, uh, okay. I think I send you the SPSS, let you install. Then I, I give you, uh, uh, because now it's very time, not enough time to, to go through. I can brief you how it looks like, the SPSS, if you've got totally no idea. Then you don't, have, you don't have to worry at all, because SPSS can cater for any values in the variable called faculty. You can key any uh, department's name under the variable name called department. You can key any value under the title called major, is something like that year of study you can cater for all the different options in spss you don't worry because that is the variation in the different team that you collect the data so they only varies in faculty department major and so on but the rest all the questions are all standard right so that same goes to uh, the team doing the game the doing the COVID 19 you know 
all the projects are quite similar. The main content, they are the same. Only the difference is the faculty that you're choosing and the major and the department only. You understand? Any more question? Doctor? Yeah. I am from TG2 T2. Uh, uh, I'm the one who emailed you about the PBS. How to draw uh, the okay. PBS. Uh, yeah, how to draw. Okay, okay. There's a question about how to draw the PBS. Okay, you, you asked me about, you said because your PBS, if you break down, become uh, like, for example, the slide, the slide in um, the previous file, right? The previous PowerPoint file. It only shows uh, about the design, right? You, you, you uh, have to line down and then draw all the sub sub design uh, sub processes. So then you ask me if you I draw about uh, analysis, if I draw about coding or testing, other things they are coming down, then the page you really fill up, right? So what do you do? So you need to be creative. So remember, if you didn't want A4 paper, I think if you do it uh, using portrait, I think you cannot draw. You have to turn into landscape, right? So even landscape, let's say you drop down one level, you draw the breakdown of the PBS. Let's say it's the design. Got the design, you got interface design, database design, whatever, okay, report design. So that one really fill up the whole A4 paper, landscape. Then you ask me, okay, what about my previous phase? Let's say I got analysis is before design. How I'm going to draw the diagram? Because it's really fill up the whole A4 paper by the design phase, the sub. Then what about analysis? You understand you draw a, a, a one line down, you put a circle there. Let's say you put a circle called A. Then the next page of the A4 paper, you start with A. You draw a line and then the breakdown of A. You understand? Then for let's say the testing or the coding, okay, or whatever, right? So you just draw a one line down. So the one that you cannot draw accommodate within the same page, you put a circle A, a circle B, circle C, circle D. So the A went branch out to another next new A4 paper page. You clear or not? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Ah, click. okay. Understand? Ah, so that means you've got a few pages. So that's why I say don't break down too many uh, levels. So up to, let's say, three levels or maybe not more than five levels. So you can draw only the second level, let's say, go one A4 paper, not enough. Maybe one of the one of the sub level can be drawn within that first sheet of A4 paper. Then the second sheet will be uh, the A, the B, the C, uh, enough. So maybe four or five pages of uh, A4 turn into landscape that will cover all the PBS or WBS. Is that clear now? So again, my advice is don't, don't have too many levels uh, because next week lecture, you are going to learn how to draw the network activity diagram. This network activity diagram will be dependent on this one on how you draw the PBS or WBS. Okay, understand? Uh, oh, so doctor, on chapter yeah. three, there's network analysis. That means we're going to learn that on the next week. Yes, after next week lecture, then you learn how to draw the network diagram. Yes. All right. So the estimating project times and cost, we can already do it, right? Because we already didn't do Yeah, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, right. Today you estimate, yeah, you can estimate the time and cost for each you break down to the lowest level, it's called WP, right? Yeah. So just now I show you the slide about WP, cost estimate for WP, that, that mm -hmm. page, uh, the labor cost, material. Uh, so you do each one, one WP, one sheet. All right. Uh, so use that one later, that one will become part of your network diagram. All right, all right. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, so that's why the arrangement of the project report is in sequence. You have to finish. If you don't finish, then you cannot do the, the later one. So that is in, in the, the proper order already. Okay, any more question? Uh, one more thing, doctor. Ah. I already sent, uh, I'm from tutorial group three, group one. I already sent my chapter one report for you to check in the ah. Google Drive. But ah. uh, since you said it's going to take a long time, ah. uh, is it advisable for us to just continue with doing the PBS? Because I'm afraid that maybe uh, after your checking, maybe you would want to correct our phases and because our PBS is connected to our phases and uh, then we have to change the whole PBS or should we just continue doing the PBS? Yeah, yeah, good question. Okay, uh, because if you send, everyone is sending to me. So some of the chapter is very long. It's take, especially uh, chapter two, you know, a lot of text that I have to read and then a lot of mistakes may have to correct. So I think the team that will receive my, you know, the, the feedback one, I, I, 
I'm sure you will know. You see how I, I corrected all your mistakes there, you know. So it's it going to take me a long time to read a chapter like that because I got other things to read as well. So the best thing is during your tutorial class, you show me your PBS. You understand? You show me and I will explain to you on the spot whether the diagram is correct or not. Then you can proceed first. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, okay, sure. Any more questions? So I will try to get back to you. Anyone who already sent me all the chapters, I try to give you back, you know, as I say, first in, first out. Uh, I will check the one who are the one that I received first. Uh, because I also got internship report to check. I got seven reports to check. So imagine they also need my feedback immediately because from the interns, the company side. Okay. So I will check whoever come in first, usually within one to two weeks. Okay. The short one, of course, I can do it quite fast. But the long one, it will take a longer time. But anyway, if you're the first in, you also, I will give you the priority first. So it should be within two weeks, you should get the feedback. If you don't get back, the feedback within two weeks then you just let me know or during tutorial class you ask me whatever parts that you need to know now because you can't wait just ask me during tutorial class i explain to you and answer your question first then you can proceed with the next section you know 3.3 3.4 and so on okay is that clear yes okay uh if if no more questions so i think basically the uh that's all i have to cover for today uh, but I uploaded one video. You can uh, watch that video. Uh, something that you can learn in uh, philosophy of life. Okay. You can watch on your own. Okay. And any other question? If not, then I will stop here. Doctor. Yeah. Um, I am from TG3 T3. Uh, I have two questions. So first question is, uh, I want to know uh, about the WP estimation, cost estimation uh, form that you showed earlier. Do we get mm. that form or do we have to make our own? The WP estimates? Ah? Yes, yes. You make your own. But the style is something like that. The one in the uh, PowerPoint slide. So we follow that style, but we do, uh, we make our own uh, form. Is that, is that right? Yes. Ah, yes. You're right. Yeah. So the next question is uh, regarding the TG3, the hot assessment uh, platform. So the other day, uh, before this, you mentioned that we would uh, we would use the platform that was prepared by your students, right? Uh -huh, yes. However, in the last yeah, tutorial... She's struggling, okay. she's struggling to set up the server. Okay. Uh. So, so will, it, will it be ready for us to use within this month? Yeah, that's why I, I hope she get ready. I want you to use her one easier instead of you and survey all the tools because I'm afraid the tools, existing tools may not be catered uh, to fulfill your needs let, let me go and check with her because she, she her things is almost there it's, it's like almost completed already, all, all the features there it's just she needs to set up the server the web hosting she she got stuck with the well, faculty cannot our, because she approached the faculty the the technical staff technical staff telling her that they only cater for certain things that uh, fulfill partial needs but not 100 percent of her needs that can set up 100 percent of the web hosting for her to run her whole system so it seems she got stuck there because only partially fulfill her needs, cannot set up totally. So uh, she's trying to find out another uh, private uh, outside one, commercial one, the web hosting service that need to pay. So we are trying to find out how much is the web hosting fees. If it's not very expensive, then maybe uh, we can pay for that and then let her set up the, the uh, her server. And then once tested, uh, everything okay already, uh, can capture the data, nothing missing. Uh, then all of you can go and use her platform. Then you don't have to survey, you know, search what tool, you know, to use. And I will ask her to set all the time for you. How many minutes to answer each question? Everything will be set in her, her system. She already designed that feature. Can, can, so can you give me, uh, let, let me check with her. Give, give me about one week time. I go and email her and ask how is her status now. And then also check out with the commercial one, the web hosting service. So whether we should go for the, the private one, the commercial web hosting, or we, we, we cannot... Uh, go for the faculty one, we we'll do it uh, using the outside one. We will pay for it if it is not very expensive. You give me one week, I check, come back to you. Then you do have to, but anyway, at the same time, if you want to survey, you can do a survey on the existing uh, test, those uh, quiz tools that you can use to design your this survey. It, it's just part, you can put it as part of your report. So it, uh, it won't be necessarily be used, is it? So you just find it in, uh, so you just, um, Look for potential uh, alternative platforms yeah. just for the 
yeah, in case is uh, you know, uh, the bad news is she really cannot get it done. We did because you also need to cannot wait for too long, right? So yes, if you yes. cannot get it done and, and, and cater for your needs, then you have to start surveying is that it will be too late. Then you must well survey all the existing quiz uh, tools that can cater for or fulfill these needs now. You've got to stand by and find out how to use it first. You learn it first, you know, because you may take some time to your learning curve. You may times to learn the how to use the tool, how to set the question timing and so on. And then uh, you stand by, get to know. You, you, you can also do a trial first while waiting for this one. If she one can go live with this straight away, all of you can use. If you give me a one, because she is doing her final year project at the same time, she also has courses assignment. She told me she also very fully occupied. Now, her main thing is to set up the server. Okay. Uh, uh, asking another student to assist her as well, you know, uh, a student uh, that is already graduated. Maybe he's more familiar with the web hosting thing. So I say, can you please try to assist her, you know, the commercialized one, you know, uh, whether he knows about this. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, so another thing uh, regarding the um, the assessment sheet, the, the, the scoring uh, for the HOTS assessment, uh, when will you uh, give that to us? Uh, I, I have a discussion with my two co-researchers. One responded, but the other one not yet. Um, uh, so I sent an email yesterday to ask him to respond to my email. One responded, uh, agree that, you know, about we will set about 10 marks for each question. But there are some questions which is subjective, right? right? For example, the creativity. Then you have to provide answers within two minutes or three minutes. You know, remember, uh, you know, the one you interpret the shape, this is a cup or this is a hat or something like that. So, uh, yes. Uh, we, we have to find out what should be the how how we can check the answer. If you are using my students, then I think I also to set that uh you know the the researcher can go and do the marking. That means we set the marks ourselves by looking what kind of answer student give. So student may give wrong answer, then we cannot assign the marks. This one will be subjective. So the other question is you have the choice. That one is the standard. If the correct answer, that's the correct answer. That's it. Okay. So but this kind of question, then we have a bit of problem. Say how we are going to assign the mark. So I'm discussing with the two researchers now. One already gave uh, me uh, his feedback. I'm waiting for the other one. Because the other lecturer told me that uh, they are having, they are usually having exam and he's very busy marking. So that's why I didn't set a time to uh, ask him that you must reply to me by when. Is it actually I have to do that? But understanding that I don't want to force him, so maybe I give him another few more days. So I try to ask him to get, uh, give me his feedback as soon as possible, and I make the decision and let you know. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Okay, welcome. Okay, any more questions for anyone? No more? If no more, then I'll see you during tutorial class. So uh, those who want me to answer your question uh, urgently so that you can proceed, then you ask me during the tutorial class. Uh, but this Friday, we are going to have a discussion of tutorial two. So please do the booking. Uh. So the all the team leaders, please check the file. In the WIH202 project teams inside there, got tutorial booking tool that file. And then you look at the one I assign. Are you assigned which team will answer question what? You look at that one first, then only discuss your team member and assign who will be the person to answer the tutorial question that I assign to each team. Right? So that's prepare for the this uh, Friday for tutorial. After the project uh, this tutorial discussion, then all the team members, any team can ask me question about your reports about you know your diagrams that you draw if any not sure then you just show to me and uh, instantly i will give you my reply so that you can proceed okay now so the because the the checking of your report is going to take me some time because it's all types it's the writing you see it's a report writing but if you just want me to check just a diagram you can ask me during tutorial class then i can give you my feedback and comments immediately okay now Okay, if no other question, then I will end uh, today's class here. Uh, if you've got any other further question, you can send me email. I'll try to reply as soon as possible. But those uh, document one, as I mentioned, it will take me at least one to two weeks. Okay, so I'll see you on this Friday. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Doctor. Okay, you're welcome. Bye bye.